by way of introduction, Eliza got her PhD from the University of Connecticut in evidence synthesis, meta-analysis, and bird-insect interactions. Uh, recently, Eliza has been a postdoctoral researcher at University of Nevada, Reno, who I've been lucky to work with on um, various things, including butterfly conservation in the West. And Eliza has really done an amazing amount in a short time. Uh, Eliza is the co-founder of Entogem, which you're going to hear about, and the co-creator of the RCN uh, for insect declines. One other bit of business before I turn it over to Eliza, we have a code of conduct that's been posted um, on the RCN site. This is a draft code of conduct at the moment. Um, we're looking for feedback, so welcome people to, to check it out. You can see the website there. Um, and, and we're looking for feedback, which you, which you can email to Chris Elphick. His email is there or contact any members of the steering committee. Get us comments however you like or feel comfortable with. Um, and we would like to make this something that works really well for everybody as soon as possible. Okay, um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Eliza. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, and yeah, and so I'll get started. This is our uh, second webinar in the webinar series. We're hoping to make these a lot more frequent. Um, and today I'm talking about uh, aggregation and synthesis of existing data to assess insect biodiversity change. So not just declines, but any type of change overall. Um, and before I want to get started, I want to acknowledge that this is part of a big collaborative effort and that there have been many, many people who have involved um, in both the planning um, and execution of the Entogem project. And so we have the leadership team, many people who have uh, participated in screening and also many funding sources. And so the three main issues that I want to talk today about today are sort of the issue of time and how long does the time series need to be before we're comfortable extracting trend data out of it to understand insect biodiversity change, um, how we can cope with some of the geographic biases on both local and global scales in terms of what data are available, um, and then also how to synthesize data for insects, which are you know, hyper diverse and there's so many insects that are described so many different ways in the literature. Um, and so a few years ago, I guess this was more than a few years ago now, people started getting really concerned about insect decline. You know, we've known for a long time, sort of based on first principles and being in the middle of biodiversity crisis, that insects are, uh, you know, in trouble. And there was this uh, study by Hellman et al. that came out back in 2017, which really catalyzed a lot of the current discussions surrounding insect declines globally. And they had been tracking flying insect biomass over um, almost three decades in Germany. And so that's on the y-axis here is biomass in grams per day, and the x-axis is time. And you can see there's this fairly consistent, steady downward trend. Of course, there's you know variation around that trend. Insects fluctuate really, really wildly from year to year. Um, but is this you know downward trend overall? And this was a really great long-term data set um, that's really good for assessing questions like this. And as people started to think more carefully about, you know, what, what do we know about insect decline? Where should we be concerned? Um, there are a lot of examples like this that people can point to and say, oh, there's, you know, the Rothamsted insect data, it's really great. Or, oh, there's this long-term ecological research site, and we can use that to assess trends. Um, and one of the issues, though, with some of these long-term monitoring sites is that they're often spatially biased. So it's not just that they're they're sort of rare in terms of what's out there in the ecology literature that is really familiar to a lot of people, but also they're situated in areas that might be the best places for monitoring. Um, so for example, this is one of the sites from the Rothamsted network where one of the light traps is. And you know, this is a really fantastic data set going back, I think to this one's in the late 60s or early 70s, this site was started and has been continuously monitored. But the location itself is, you know, in this area that is, you know, still natural and semi-natural land, which is shown here in green, um, but surrounded by, you know, areas of developed lands and farmland. And so we're sort of monitoring the last remaining habitat, which is great. And that's where we can get these long-term time series. Um, but it's also important to know, you know, what's going on in the adjacent farm fields and the data sets that come from there. And scaling up beyond sort of you know, local scale biases and where we situate long-term monitoring programs. Um, we have, you know, massive geographic bias at the global scale. Um, so a few years ago, Roald Van Klink and colleagues published um, a meta-analysis on insect um, trends globally. This is shown for terrestrial insects, 
or I should say invertebrates, um, and they uh, had restricted to, you know, 10 years of data or longer. So we're looking at multi-decadal data sets to pull out trends, because often you do need those really long-term time series to credibly estimate trends. And one of the issues when you restrict to, you know, those multi-decadal data sets is that there's often a geographic bias. So, you know, many of the data sets that um, they found were in Europe or North America, um, and that, you know, the entire continent of Africa is represented by a single data set that was at least 10 years um, or longer. And so when you're thinking about synthesizing insect data set on a global scale, we often have to confront sort of the conflict between the geographic bias and the time bias, um, and also did the, the huge diversity of insects and how scattered the literature is. Because um, I think, you know, one of the issues, especially with insects, is that it is exponentially growing number of publications. Um, and so that's on the y-axis here is number of cumulative publications. Um, so this is just one sub-discipline within ecology over time. And you know, things are just taking off exponentially where we're publishing more and more studies every single year. And so it's increasingly really difficult to go back and actually synthesize data because it's coming from so many different studies. Um, and with insects, I think it's especially challenging because we describe them so many different ways within the literature. So for example, if you wanna search for long-term or multi-year studies on insects, you need to also think about disease vectors as a subfield where people might not say, oh, I have this fantastic long-term mosquito data set to say, I have a lot of information on disease vector monitoring, or for example, on agricultural pests, invasive species, uh, pollinator assemblages, or even as sort of food for insectivores, uh, such as birds, bats, and so on. And so, um, or even as, you know, water quality indicators, as opposed to thinking of insects as insects, you know, they're representing something else within the ecosystem, which is how people study them in many cases. Um, and so, uh, trying to actually search for all of these different uh, scattered sets of uh, data is really important to be able to understand insect biodiversity change, but also really, really challenging. Um, because as I sort of previewed before, you have to think about the time series length. You know, is it, do we need multi-decadal data sets in all cases to be able to characterize trends? And, you know, is it better to have several 50-year data sets or would you rather have, you know, a thousand three-year data sets? And what can you get out of that statistically in terms of shared trends across space, for example? Um, and also uh, geographically, you know, if, if we are restricting to only really long time series, are we missing many shorter time series from parts of the world that are often overlooked in global syntheses that could tell us something about what's happening with the diversity there? Um, and then also coping, which is, as I said before, the diversity of insects, how do you actually search for all of them? Um, and so at this point, I should probably admit I'm not really an entomologist. I am mostly a meta-analyst meta-analyst, so I focus on sort of evidence synthesis, how we gather data and synthesize it better. And I've been working over the past uh, several years on tools to um, make evidence synthesis more efficient. Um, and my collaborator, Graham Montgomery, knew that I had been working on all of these tools for meta-analysis and gathering or gathering the literature to pull data out and said, you know, that there's this really big issue in entomology, which is insect decline and trying to find all of these scattered data sets to synthesize it. And so we decided, decided to start a project together uh, called Entogem. And Entogem it stands for the Entomological Global Evidence Map, which was the best acronym we could come up with in about an entire afternoon of brainstorming. Um, and the goal of Entogem is to um, systematically go through all of the literature published and unpublished to find multi-year data sets that can be used to assess insect population and biodiversity trends globally. And when we were setting up Entogen, we wanted to make sure that it was um, really open and transparent and that the entire community of researchers who wanted to be involved would be able to. Um, and so Graham and I, so this is uh, Graham up in the upper left corner, uh, we recruited a group of entomologists, conservation biologists, uh, meta-analysts, uh, statisticians, people who are really excellent at searching the literature. Um, and we came up with a plan for how we were going to search the literature, uh, which types of studies we would include and what we would exclude, um, what types of metadata we would pull out of the studies, um, and then how we were going to make this resource available. 
Um, and one of the, the issues, as I hinted at, is how to search for insect literature um, because they're described so many different ways. And we wanted to be really careful about how we did that. And so we used an R package that I developed called Lit Searcher, um, which helps to select keywords for uh, systematic reviews and meta analyses. And the way it works is you feed in a set of articles that are probably relevant to a topic. Um, so not, you know, not an exhaustive systematic review, but, oh, you know, here's 100 articles that are most likely on this topic. Um, and it goes through and pulls out potential keywords. Um, so for this article about uh, trends in monthly abundance of species richness of crabids, uh, Lit Searcher identified monthly abundance as a keyword, uh, species richness, Southwest Germany, which you're probably thinking is not a great keyword, um, and other things like consistent declines, insect abundance, long-term surveys. And for each of these keywords, they go into this keyword co-occurrence network shown here on the right, where each keyword is represented as one of these bubbles and the black lines between them are co-occurrences. So for example, because insect abundance and long-term surveys are both in this abstract, they're co-occurring. And that lets the best terms sort of float to the center of the network where we can then um, use those to uh, improve our search and make sure we're not missing terms. Um, and so we used Lit Searcher and then also um, pulled uh, some data from uh, sort of uh, more taxonomic resources and identified about 1,500 names and synonyms for insect. So we didn't want to just search for insect because often, you know, when we're writing papers in the title and abstract, you wouldn't say, oh, we studied insects. You'd say we studied butterflies or uh, damselflies or, you know, maybe using the common name or we studied a pollinator assemblage. Um, and then we also had, you know, somewhere around 45 uh, terms for population responses and also um, over time looking for these long-term monitoring studies. And we searched 16 different databases, um, so far only in English, and got uh, over 600,000 articles. But luckily, because we searched 16 databases, many of those are duplicate records across different databases. Um, and so we used an R package that I developed with a collaborator from Atlas of Living Australia to remove the duplicates, which gave us 130,835 unique articles that may or may not have multi-year data sets on insect population and biodiversity trends uh, that could help us sort of understand uh, insect decline or changes over time. Um, and one of the reasons that there are so many articles is because when you're doing a search really systematically and trying not to miss anything, you often retrieve a lot of really irrelevant publications. Um, so for example, if you search for changes in the abundance of insects and you take those search terms and you put them into a database, what you get out is a lot of changes in the abundance of or gene abundance in Drosophila, um, which is not what we were looking for. Um, and so, you know, we really just want those population and community studies. And so we used a um, sort of automated approach to reclassify all of the documents from the Entogem library that we'd assembled um, into ones that were uh, probably long-term multi-year monitoring and ones where we're not quite sure what they are. They might be just for Sothala, they might be something else, but we'll come back to them later. And we took uh, that set of articles, we had 7,091 articles in the priority set, um, and I took those and uploaded them to this open screening platform called CISREV. And on CISREV, um, a bunch of people can join the project. So anyone who is interested in the community who wanted to participate in article screening um, just had to do a little bit of training to make sure we were all on the same page about what the criteria were for an article to be included. Um, and then people could go through and decide whether or not an article met the inclusion criteria, meaning it had multiple years of insect population and, and diversity or community trends. Um, or if it did not actually have that, you know, the single year study or didn't have a population response, for example. And so we, I then took those user decisions of whether or not articles should be included or excluded and fit a model predicting the probability of inclusion for every single article based on the uh, keywords using sort of that same keyword extraction algorithm from Lit Searcher in the title and abstract and uh, fit that for whether articles users said should be excluded because they definitely didn't meet the criteria. If it was unclear if they met the criteria and you know, we needed to look at the full text because the abstract didn't have the information we needed or if they should be included. And if we use a cutoff of about 0.2 probability of inclusion, 
um, as a minimum. There's this hugely dense cloud of articles that users who manually reviewed them said this should be excluded. And of course, there are articles that people said should be included that are also below that cutoff, but it's far fewer. Um, and we can keep training the models as we go along and we'll get back to those. But in the meantime, we can exclude all of these articles. I think that allowed us to automatically exclude about 50,000 articles that we just have very low probability of actually having multiple years of insect data. And so with the remaining 123,000 articles that weren't screened as part of the priority set, plus the predicted probability of inclusion. Um, we did some automated taxa tagging to figure out which taxonomic groups were likely represented in articles um, and set up five priority subprojects. So one on Hymenoptera, so bees, wasps, and ants. Um, the reason for that is sort of the, you know, really huge functional diversity and diversity of life forms in Hymenoptera makes them a good case study for finding some of the issues along the way and testing the methods out. Um, for example, you know, what, what counts as an abundance metric for ants and is it, you know, number of colonies, number of mounds, number of individuals, biomass, for example. Um, we also focused on odinits, um, so dragonflies and damselflies. Um, and that project is now actually complete. It's um, published in Conservation Science and Practice if you want to read more of the methods that went into it. There's an ongoing project on moths. Um, and then two more that are not taxonomically focused, but rather on different subjects. So one on drought, which is led by Dave Wagner, um, and then one on food food, um, which is led by Danielle Schwartz. Um, and she's looking for articles that um, entomologists may not search for because uh, ornithologists, for example, collect a lot of uh, long-term insect data, but they often refer to it as things like prey availability or you know invertebrate food abundance and not actually on insects. And for all of these projects, um, we go through, screen all of the abstracts first to decide if articles may or may not meet inclusion, and then look at the full text to, again, make sure that they meet the inclusion criteria and also to pull out metadata. And all of the projects feed into this central Entogem database where um, we have the metadata from the studies. So um, we can see, you know, where in the world studies took place and over how long uh, time or the, the palette, the color palette for time series length only goes up to 50, but there are some in here that are marked as NA because they're over 400 years of data. Um, so they're just sort of way beyond the uh, scale that we were anticipating. And people can go in and filter for how long studies were, which taxonomic groups were included, how they were sampled, sort of some of the more basic metadata. Um, and this is sort of, this is the, I guess you could say the final product of Entogem is this database. So we get as far as identifying where data sets likely exist, or <laughs> not where they likely exist, where data sets exist, because we know that they've been, you know, written up and published before. Um, but we don't actually extract the time series data themselves um, or the abundance numbers. We point people in the direction and say, you know, if you wanted to, for example, do a meta analysis on, Odinets, you could check this box that had studies for at least five years. Um, and it used, let's say, visual surveys. You could get that subset of articles and then put those into a meta analysis, um, at least as the starting basis. Um, but I did want to talk quickly about sort of the next steps from there, or what, you know, as a community, we should be thinking about in terms of not just finding data sets, but making them available and accessible. Because you can think of data availability along a whole spectrum from sort of completely unavailable to actually archived and accessible and open where people can find that information. Um, and uh, when I'm talking about things that are archived, I mean, you know, publicly archived in sources like Dryad, BigShare, or some more um, specialized uh, data sets like one by the um, IFPRI, and also sort of more temporary repositories. So for example, GitHub is not a permanently archived repository, but you can make data um, available through it for other researchers. There are also you know, data that are accessible, but not archived. So for example, this figure um, from a paper a long time ago um, is about uh, tsetse fly abundance, I believe. Um, and you could, you know, pull out this exact data set using a package like MetaDigitize, for example, in R, and get the full underlying data set that's reported here. So it's accessible, but it's not archived. Uh, there's also data that are available, but uh, really, really difficult to get to where I wouldn't necessarily call them accessible. For example, sometimes you get to the end of a paper and you see, you know, 
data are available on uh, floppy disks in this office, or we've accessioned all of our uh, raw data or the, the data sheets, at least in a library. Um, and so it's it's available, but we can't actually get to it. Um, and of course, towards uh, the other end of the spectrum, often you'll see, you know, data are available on request. And so then sometimes you'll send an email to the authors to request the data. And, you know, oftentimes people will actually send you their data and say, yep, here you go. This is great. Just wanted to know how it's being used. Um, but also, you know, fairly often people will either get no email response back or just, you know, uh, decline to share the data where they're actually just unavailable. And so one of the things that I think is gonna be really important going forward, um, especially thinking about sort of the long-term life of Entergem and how um, you know, I see it being used by others, is to really move data from the sort of unavailable to the more archived side of the spectrum. Because um, Entergem is really just helping with making things findable, not with the archiving process. Um, but I wanted to put in a plug that there is a group uh, called Glitters, the Global Insect Threat Response Synthesis. In one aspect of uh, their project, there's many different aspects to it. It's really great. You should uh, check it out. The website is at the bottom of the screen there, is moving data from sort of that on request or available to archived and putting things into a data paper, um, especially for the long time, uh, long term time series of 10 years or longer. Um, and so I encourage you to go and look at what they're doing there and think about, you know, if you have data sets yourself that are sort of available on request, you're maybe accessible but not archived, to consider pushing them along that data availability spectrum so that they can be included in global syntheses on insect biodiversity change. Um, and so to just sort of wrap up really quickly here, um, the goal of Entergem really is a resource to facilitate synthesis and to make things more open and accessible to everyone working in this field. Um, and so we're, you know, we didn't make restrictions on time series length as long as time series are at least two years or longer. Um, we included them um, from any habitat anywhere in the world. Um, and at whatever taxonomic resolution the authors reported, that's what we include in the database. We have the ongoing projects for Hymenoptera and moths, which are both at the full text screening stage. Um, and so hopefully we'll be done soon. Um, uh, the bird feed study is also at full text screening. Drought is well underway with abstracts and then the ODINIT project is finished. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say that so far we've only searched in English, um, but we do really, really want to move into more multilingual synthesis. Um, it's estimated, you know, about a third of articles in conservation are published in languages other than English. Um, and so we're really looking for uh, collaborators who are interested in expanding the Antigen project into other languages um, or to other taxonomic groups or subsets. Um, and so with that, I'm going to end the presentation uh, portion of today's webinar and we'll switch to uh, discussion, sort of group discussion, group discussion about data availability and synthesis.